This is the Indignance on CHRW. You're with Mike Roy, Sean Forrester, Samuel Saba, Will Reed, Anthony, and today we're going to pick up from where we left off last time. Um, it was about three months ago. The Occupy movement in Wall Street had just uh, started up recently, and Occupy Toronto was in the not too distant future. And Occupy London wasn't even a sparkle in anybody's eye at that point, and some of us didn't even believe it was going to happen. Yeah, but we're not going to go there. Oh, um, yes, we are. But right. At the time we recorded the last show, the main focus here, at least for most of us, was that we were going to support the Toronto occupation and uh, try and keep that going as much as possible with our own London crew, which happened, and London did have a significant influence on Toronto, but... Um, the, the, we ended up with our own occupation going on here in London as well. And we got evicted on the morning of November 9th, and uh, the group has stayed active and has pulled a number of direct actions and kept uh, assemblies and committees active, at least up to this point. We've been deeply involved in the struggle at EMD with the CAW since January 1st, and uh, I don't know. we. Uh, we have quite a few fans in the radical world, I'd say. Uh, it was probably a couple of weeks before Toronto started mm -hmm. that um, a bunch of us decided to go up and experience that. And some of us did spend a little bit of time there. A few of us didn't, unfortunately. Um, but can anybody share a little bit of the experience they had uh, up in Toronto? In Toronto, uh, uh, a lot of London uh, activists played a very major role in helping getting Toronto going, uh, f uh, working functionally. Uh, their GAs were often huge and unwieldy, and th these these are essentially autonomous spaces that are... Um, uh, uh, they're, they're essentially autonomous spaces that um, uh, we're essentially figuring out everything as we're going along. Facilitation, dealing with homelessness, mental illnesses, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and, um, you know, a number of us uh, had proposed, you know, ways to make the GAs more functional. Um, uh, there were several of us in key places in media. Um, I was really impressed with um, the participatory democracy that everybody seemed to pick up and take liking to. And, I mean, it's a really difficult thing for a lot of people to start getting into because it's so long and drawn out, um, but it is very inclusive and uh, everybody can participate in it. So, out of all the experiences that everybody's had over the last three, um, three to four months, what do you think is the thing that sticks out the most out of all your experiences with um, the Occupy movement? I wouldn't mind starting with Anthony with this one. I guess there's different answers. Um, my favorite moment was probably during the uh, um, austerity march we did um, where the police were trying to block us off on Richmond and that was the first time we sort of burst through their line and I thought that was a really great moment um, personally and I think for the group um, having the London Day of Action with the labor people was a pretty big day for London and for our movement. I think one of the most promising uh, developments that I, I, I saw uh, within the camps um, was essentially uh, not not only the high level of discussion uh, and uh, critical discussion on the nature of society, uh, interpersonal relations, uh, how we treat each other, uh, the marginalization of uh, different groups, but uh, when people are arguing too, there was kind of more of a sense of openness where I saw so many more people in the camps actually admitting they were wrong, changing their views, and then working on um, uh, uh, working on. Um, you know what the other person suggested whereas you know uh, arguing anywhere else uh, usually it's you know a battle of wills just yelling at each other <coughs> until uh, you know one person is forced to you know um, it's usually extremely frustrating but um, you know essentially the process of uh, consensus and particip uh, p participatory democracy you know it, it got people in a, a mindset where it was more collaborative and people were more willing to listen to each other's ideas and then build on that together Mike, um, why do you think our camp was closed down? Um, because we were an annoyance to the city. Why? Because we were in their way and we were basically a dirty little secret that they wanted to rub out. I'm so glad that you brought that up, dirty little secret, because everything else was in the open now. Suddenly we were encountering people that 
weren't ashamed to bring their problems forward and suddenly we were realizing oh my goodness this is our problem now anthony why do you think joe fontana didn't understand that <laughs> well um i'm not sure if he did or didn't i think it's irrelevant i think what he stands for is in direct opposition to what we were standing for that uh what was going on in the park was completely oppositional to what goes on at City Hall. That uh, even though we were small and sort of insignificant in a way, we were very threatening because uh, we were spreading dangerous ideas and representing defiance. And um, <laughs> and uh, they just couldn't allow that to continue, especially since it wasn't just going on in one city. Since it was going on all over the place, it really represented a broad threat to, to powerful interests. One thing that I noticed over the last three, four months that's been really, really peculiar, because we've been activists before, everybody's sitting here, and really never received as much attention in, in many respects. Um, the amount of people that come out, new people, the amount of people who want to learn, and also the amount of police and city attention. It seems like every time we step out our door, um, we've got an escort of some sort now. Um, you know, three three months down the road, if we want to have a, a gathering, um, there seems to be police or city officials following us around. Uh, I think the, the amount of intimidation and repression is um, because precisely it was oriented towards, you know, uh, an open-based inclusive movement, and they wanted to uh, make certain that people know that uh, if you involve yourself in these processes, you will be watched uh, if the police are paying attention to it, that, you know, it's potentially illegal or something like that. Essentially, just for uh, supporting campers, um, you know, who are, you know, starting to talk about the problems in our society. Uh, just that basic level of dialogue is almost unacceptable for them. The police presence um, is sort of unusual for what we've experienced before, uh as activists in London, just locally, uh, because this is definitely part of a worldwide movement. And it was just interesting to see the sort of timing with the evictions, how they all seem to happen, like within, what, a two-week span of each other. And it seemed that there, especially in the United States, there was definitely a collusion uh, between local governments, um, like in Oakland and New York, to to evac uh to repress the campers uh, more or less simultaneously. Uh, it kind of harkens back back to the day of uh, COINTELPRO, where the FBI would coordinate with uh, local law enforcement agencies to um, uh, crush uh, the Black Panthers, um, any kind of social dissent, um, you know, any liberation groups or anything like that. People don't realize, like, uh, just in our recent march to the plant, um, uh, to the EMD plant, uh, during the uh, the day of action against Caterpillar, uh, there was about maybe 100, 150 activists there, but we had uh, essentially two buses of riot police behind us, um, you know, an obscene amount of um, watchdogs, like there's one cop for every person. Well, yeah, just take a look, every time we want to do an action around town, they're always uh, surrounding us. The day after our eviction, we had a general assembly, and um, they encircled our circle. So, you know, and then a couple other GAs later, we, we had to go up and ask them just to back off. And then they started backing off a little bit. But every time we're around, they increase uh, security at City Hall. And uh, the, remember when they followed us around with that tent? Mm -hmm. you know, we did this action in London where we wanted to put down a tent. It was going to be a flash mob. We wanted to put down a tent in a parking spot. Well, we put the word out the night before that we were going to do it. Then the next morning, um, about eight city officials were there stating that it was going to cost us $530 for the ticket. Now, we'd already done something similar. Uh, well, activists in town, at least, have done something similar. Um, I think some of us assumed that uh, we'd be able to set up in a parking spot and not be harassed because Habermas Hole did that in the summer a number of times. Uh, through some people at EVAC. When the day came and we gathered, this, some city officials came right up to us and told us we were going to get fined. So um, we decided to kind of try and lead them on a wild goose chase for a while and get them to follow us, and they did all over the place, which uh, lent itself to a pretty hilarious video. And um, 
yeah so we made a game of it and then ended up putting a tent on top of a vehicle to uh sort of sidestep the rules of the bylaw and it ended up just being sort of a fun event uh i think evading them was more of an accomplishment than anything else we did that day and uh I don't know. It's just kind of funny how they have such a different reaction to groups, and they seem to really, uh, really have it in for anything Occupy. Uh, the the selective enforcement of bylaws has been uh, kind of a way to sidestep um, uh, a lot of these issues to to come at us from like, oh well, it's not um, it's not safe for them to be in the park, or like um, they're killing the grass, like these little side issues uh, to kind of. Um, you know, harass us. Um. Wait, killing the grass? Can you expand on that? That was one of the complaints made against Occupy London was that we were damaging the park as well as uh, just being such a, a menace and nuisance that people were avoiding the park. But, I mean, for most of us there who also frequented Victoria Park regularly before, it seemed we had as much or more traffic than there ever was before. And uh, I don't see where we really damaged anything in the park, but that was a complaint against us. I think that you bring up a really good point, Sean, about the selective enforcement of the bylaw, because um, your example with the uh, with the day that we led the police around with the tent, uh, and in the park, how I had no idea that there even was a bylaw that you couldn't be in the park after a certain time. Uh, I had no idea that that law even existed until... Because uh, every day in the park, there's people there till after midnight oh, yeah. in the summer. <laughs> you can still see, like, drunks hobbling through, like, 2 in the morning. Um, yeah, like, uh, and since the, since the eviction, too, uh, I think there is now a new bylaw on the record. It's uh, pretty much specifically to prevent uh, large kind of um, <laughs> gatherings like the one we had, uh, where there can't be more than 20 to 25 people uh, for a single purpose in a, a public area. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're, we're thinking we should go to one of the skating rinks because there's usually 20 to 25 people there all skating, which is a common purpose, and call the bylaw officer because that is, um, that is in direct contravention to the bylaw. But they're never going to enforce something like that. It's only uh, for the purposes of social and political repression. Mm-hmm. Got a big question for everybody. <laughs> What do you think this has accomplished in the last three, four months? Personally, um, I think it brought a lot of people together to have dialogue. What do you guys think it's brought to the, you know, what, what is this, what's changed? Has anything changed? Is this, is this brought anything out in the last three, four months, this movement? Um, yeah, I get told all the time by people, mostly unassociated with us, that we accomplished nothing. And even a few people, shockingly, that have been somewhat associated with us really down what we've accomplished. And I don't know, maybe I'm just naive or easily uh, convinced. I don't know. But uh, from my perspective, as someone who's been making tiny millimeter gains at a time, uh, it's just on every level we've accomplished more. The media attention has been more in you know, a couple months than we had for years all put together. The amount of discussion with regular people, the amount of new faces joining in on things, the amount of online discussion, the all of that. I mean, the amount of actions we did in the last few months compared to normal. I mean, on every level, I'd say joining joining together with the labor movement. I know even though some people are critical of that, I mean, I think that was a massive step, especially locally. We've never had ties like this. And, I mean, yeah, we're going to need all of that we're, we're, for what's coming up. We're going to need all that. And Occupy has kind of been a step forward in that way. I kind of think of it like like a great awakening, like North Americans are slowly bursting out of their bubble and that we did our own contribution locally. What about the changes in people? Have you noticed um, anything with that, an influx of people that are really interested in things or wanting to learn, well, seeking yeah. knowledge? I think they've been there all along. Just now they found something to plug into. Uh, it's accomplished a lot just because before this movement even started, nobody was really talking about the income disparity between um, yeah, the rich and the poor. Uh, it's phrased in the terms of 1% versus 99%. Um, but uh, it, it represents a growing kind of class consciousness that um, we don't share um, 
these sociopathic uh, people who run our society's ideals. Uh, they, they're also the ones that um, write and enforce the laws uh, that, that we follow. They're not for our benefit. They're for... Um, you know the, the direct benefit of those at the top of our society uh, as well as um, I've, I've seen uh, personally in the local Occupy movement um, we've helped people get off of hard drugs um, in Windsor uh, they helped homeless people move into um, affordable buildings um, there's um, uh, as well as uh, the in the states um, the focus on squatting now uh, is a clear escalation in tactics from just camping in the park or anything like that um, it's uh, as a political issue. Uh, it's obscene to me that there, uh, especially in London, there are so many abandoned and foreclosed homes, and there's so much poverty and homelessness. And we need to start highlighting um, the discrepancies between, um, you know, just putting two and two together of, you know, why are these buildings left uh, uh, abandoned and rotting when they could be put to good use, like community social centers, affordable housing. Um, I mean, it it's really illustrates greed, uh, you know, principles of greed um, rather than need. But even more than that, I thought that was a big part of it. The individual issues, especially like wealth and distribution of wealth, was sort of a foundational issue. And there was a lot of other issues that came with it as well. But to me, what really Occupy, where it started to be different than, than other... Uh, other things that have happened was that it really got to the to the system itself like the main arguments it ended up not taking long before the group basically agreed that it was the system itself not any not a few bad politicians or you know one bad system or you know one set of problems but a systemic problem and that we were promoting participatory democracy as an alternative and that we were representing sort of the broader community's interests on that. Uh, it's kind of like if a, if a house's foundations, uh, if a house is built on rotten foundations, uh, no amount of, you know, exterior decorating or, you know, um, <laughs> you know gradual Painting. reforms are going to fundamentally change the, uh, the structure of that system. Um, I, and I think our com entire system, uh, our uh, institutional education, uh, you know, our justice system, our how we politically organize, um, our focus on... Um, you know, profits over social needs and stuff like that. They're all signs of fundamentally, uh, you know, rotten foundations of our society uh, and nothing short than um, complete social revolution in how we organize, how we treat each other is going to go to the root of all of these problems. Uh, the word radical, uh, too, uh, is essentially means, you know, getting to the root of um, these problems. Well, um, there's a saying, right? Um, dismantling the master's house using the master's tools. I, I, I might not be phrasing it right, but I've always challenged that and um, said, no, I'm going to create my own tools. And I think, I think in, in, in my head, at least, um, Occupy is creating its own tools. And to create its own tools, takes time and for those that have been really big uh critics i i would i would say that they're missing out on something really big um a baby isn't born overnight uh it takes nine months and this is our baby uh these are our tools and we're going to take our time building them um birthing them use whatever metaphor I wanted to talk about our critics, but I wouldn't mind getting Will's uh, input on this real quick, though. Yeah, I just find it refreshing um, to see that in North America something's finally happening. And um, it seems to me that this is one of the few instances of people beginning to see themselves as a class again in North America, uh, whether you're formulating it in the traditional terms of working class and possessing class or proletariat and bourgeoisie or the 99% and the 1%, mm -hmm. uh, it start, it's starting to become very clear, uh, I think, to people that in society there are sides and there are opposing interests, as you were saying, Sean. And um, it's just very interesting and sort of inspiring to see people coming to this consciousness um, to, first off, seeing themselves as part 
uh, of a class and then going out in the street and mobilizing and watching the police and the agents of repression coming and they see that their uh you know the opposing side sees them uh for what they're starting to see themselves as if that makes sense mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they can use that as sort of like a platform to move towards even uh higher modes of mobilization i mean like the the rich have always had class consciousness they know they're <laughs> rich yeah. i mean uh it's um uh they they uh they tend to use media entertainment and stuff like that to spread the ideas of cultural hegemony. the education system yeah, uh, to spread the ideals of cultural hegemony, which is essentially uh, making people um, identify with you know, the ideals of the rich. Um, you know, uh, like they they point to lottery winners or whoever wins a million dollars on Survivor or something, and says, "See, you can do it too." These are the exception; they're not the rule. These are hierarchical pyramids um, with you know um, smaller and smaller. Um, uh, less and less room at the top um, as you climb the ladder. Uh, and, like, it, it's true in academia. It's true in all aspects of society. Um, you can't um, benefit uh, in this society without trampling on other people. But what ladder, and I, I always wonder about this ladder, and why is there an assumption made that we want this ladder? Um, along with, with, you know, the class differences, I'm, I'm going to say it, uh, there are there is the culture of bullying um, that I encounter all the time. People that share the same class, whatever class that may be, face bullying. For instance, one of my professors, who's a tenure, um, refused to come to an event because he was afraid he would get fired. Um, I think by fired he meant he would be bullied for coming to an event to show his support. So there's this culture, um, you know, you, you climb this imaginary ladder um, and, and you get there um, and then you face this bullying. On to the critics. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's some critics out there. I mean, criticism's good. And some of the things that some of the critics criticize the movement for are good, I believe, as well. You know, but I find that a lot of the critics end up being the people that don't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, usually they're the armchair, they think they're the armchair activists, and um, they'd rather not go out and contribute or, or anything like that. And they're really the quickest ones at saying, uh, you know, the movement's not doing enough, it's not going anywhere, you people aren't doing anything. And I think they forget to realize that it's only four or five months old now. So it's just a baby. And if you take a look at, say, the movement in the 60s, the peace movement for Vietnam and that, it lasted, what, about a decade, right? So, uh, I mean, a lot of these people have functionally nihilistic worldviews as well. Like, nothing's going to work, so why bother? Why should we resist? Um, you know, uh, to, to these critics um, who are who don't think the movement's doing enough or going in the right directions, uh, then please form your own groups and, you know, at, at least start doing something. Uh, start talking with other people that agree with you. Uh, if, if you think Occupy's not doing enough to help the homeless, um, make an anti-poverty or homeless uh, or anti-eviction network or something like that. Um, you know, it's um, just, just kind of shrugging your so shoulders and being like, oh, well, it's not effective, so, you know, I can feel more comfortable going back to my house and watching Survivor. You know, uh, it's... Uh, um, uh, it's kind of um, it's it, it's it's not in the realm of you know constructive criticism or valid criticism. I don't think. Um, yeah. Well, um, do your friends come out? Have your friends come out to all the Occupy? And if not, why? I think uh, most of my friends have come out to Occupy events, um, but it's sort of to varying degrees which i think one of the interesting issues that may work into criticism is people who have been involved and just sort of gotten burnt out or yeah i don't know i just have this weird um experience i don't know if this jives with anyone else uh but that even after you've done something that uh you could objectively say is a highly successful event you still feel kind of like disappointed or like it could have been better. It's sort of this weird uh, duality that sometimes that feeling 
may um, push activists to try harder and do more, uh, but it could also really um, demoralize people. Mm -hmm. Has anybody else experienced that? Oh, for sure. There's a constant sense of disappointment that comes with organizing (laughs) and discouragement. And I think Occupy just magnified everything. So our accomplishments got bigger, our disappointments got bigger, the interpersonal dynamics, all of the stickiness that came with that got bigger. I mean, for a lot of us, this has been a really trying experience for sure. And a lot of us have taken short breaks or not so short breaks along the way to uh, sort of re-energize and refocus because it is demanding. Yeah, the burnout factor is probably one of the biggest things. Um, I think another thing, too, that I think a lot of groups have recognized is people coming into one of the, say, the General Assemblies have a hard time trying to um, fit a peg in what they want to do and what kind of committee they want to be in. They can't really see how the organization works, even though it's really not an organization, but it is. And they try to locate a spot and become frustrated. So, I mean, that's something that we need to be able to work on as a group as well to help find uh, spots for people to fit in. Um, so Some of the, the valid criticisms that I have read, uh, one of the uh, members of a working group in Occupy Wall Street uh, came out with an excellent article that you should probably all read. Uh, it's called the, the Three Complaints About OWS, Occupy Wall Street, and uh, it discusses, uh, you know, problems inherent with how we structurally organize, like uh, the, the bounce uh, rate for people who are interested is much too high. Like, we don't retain um, the participation of a lot of people that come in. Yeah, like, there are uh, some obstacles of not a lot of people know what consensus-based democracy is. I think at our events, we're we're going to start at least, you know, uh, every meeting should start with maybe a 10-minute introduction to the basics of consensus, the how important the participants are, uh, actively listening, not using it as a soapbox, you know, kind of collectively you know, building on each other's ideas, um, you know, uh, j- just the structure of it uh, itself, like uh, having uh, effective training for facilitators, uh, rotating those facilitators so they don't, um, you know, become a traditional kind of leadership role or anything like that. Uh, so the role of facilitators in general assemblies and committees and stuff like that is essentially, they're, they're, they're just there to facilitate the conversation. They can't actually input with their, or they shouldn't um, input their own personal views, or uh, it's just to make sure that everybody gets um, a say, feels like their voice has been heard. You know, there, there's a lot of other aspects like note takers, mood minders, um, people who, you know, if people are getting tired, suggesting a break, suggesting go arounds and stuff like that, so that um, you know it is an actual basis for us actually ha- regaining some of the control over our own lives and actually being able to make decisions on a larger scale.